Well, delegates, uh, delegates, for those of you who didn't see that, uh, Mike pinched the microphone, <laughs> but he's given me it back now. Uh, it was kind of, uh, kind of Michael to, but we can't see. It was a uh... right. Is this mic working? Hello. On the stage mic. How about these mics? Are these mics working? Yeah. yeah? Good. Well, I, I was going to say that that Michael pinched the microphone. <laughs> But I, then I heard that the folk at the back couldn't see. <laughs> it was kind. Uh, it was kind of Mike to uh, to mention that uh, the dream shall never die uh, is top of the bestsellers list. Uh, that's true. Uh, it's also top of the bestsellers list across the UK, which should give. <laughs> which should. Uh, Give our friends in the metropolitan press something to explain, I suspect, but never mind. Anyway, if you all buy another copy next week, <laughs> it can be top of the bestsellers list next Sunday as well. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, the, the book is in three parts. Uh, that's a beginning, middle, and an end. <laughs> but I, I'm going to start with uh, a, a reading from the the very end of the book, uh, day 100, uh, the day after the referendum declaration, a, a day which I'm sure that all of us in this hall uh, remember full well. Uh, and this is uh, what I wrote about uh, that Friday. Uh, and this is set uh, just after I, I made my resignation speech as, as First Minister. I add the uh, final sentence of my resignation speech only at the last minute. Uh, the version handed out to the press doesn't have the line, for me as leader, my time is nearly over, but for Scotland, the campaign continues uh, and the dream shall never die. I'm, uh, I'm kind of glad I added that line, actually. It would have made the book title more difficult if I hadn't, you know. I mean, <laughs> I take questions, and I thank everyone for being there. I'm calm, I always am in situations like that. That's the advantage of writing your own book. You can always write yourself up, you know. <laughs> but as I prepare to leave the stage, I notice that the BBC Scotland veteran, Brian Taylor, who for a generation has observed just about everything in the development of a national story, has a tear or two in his eye. I place my hand briefly on his shoulder as I walk to the door. It is done. Moira, Elaine Kay, Fergus Much and I set off homewards to Aberdeenshire. When we get to Prestonfield House, Johnny has revved up the copter. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is Johnny Hydro. Uh, and he's called Johnny Hydro not because he works for the Hydroelectric Board, but because he has a hydroelectric plant in his croft north of Inverness. So I call him Johnny Hydro. <laughs> Johnny has revved up the helicopter. The entire private office staff and the events team from the civil service have lined the entrance to say goodbye. It's a nice touch. I warn them that I have checked the civil service manual and there's no overtime whatsoever for this situation, <laughs> even on a Friday evening. As we move to, to leave, I notice a photographer hiding in the bushes. I beckon her out and pose for a photo with Johnny beside his helicopter. On the way north, I post a picture of Moira and me with our headsets on onto the parody site Angry Salmon, hashtag sexy socialism. Yeah. 
This uh, has been a, a source of constant humour and a fair bit of insight throughout the campaign. I judge it's time it receives some official recognition. Angry has tweeted, for the record, I never lost. I simply repositioned the location of victory. I post, angry Sam, and hashtag sexy social democracy. I'll leave that in your capable hands. Angry replies, I think some universe ending paradox has just occurred from one reality to another. Believe in sexy socialism. <laughs> it is a, a glorious September evening eh, as we sweep up the east coast of Scotland. Johnny, who has ambitions of entering into shared distillery ownership, points out a new distillery being built in the East Nuke of Fife. As we pass over the Yes City of Dundee, into my head comes Robert Burns's reworking of a, an old Jacobite song, Bonnie Dundee. Then a war to the hills, to the lee, to the rocks, Ere I own a usurper, I'll couch with a the fox. Then tremble false whigs in the midst of your glee. You've not seen the last of my bonnets and me. Now, as a lot of this has been impromptu, as you see from one stage to another, we're going to be impromptu here and have a few questions between Alec and myself. But those of you who want to ask a question shortly should identify yourselves. Put your hands up, stand up, and we'll get a microphone to you in a minute. And we'll do some of Markham and Wise's best and we'll do. routines. We will, yes, exactly. We've always been wanting to do a music hall act, Alec and I. Listen, the question, I read this yesterday from cover to cover. And it's a very good read, I have to say. Worth How long did it take you? It, it took me about three hours. Three hours? Three hours, yeah. Oh, a slow it, reader. Well, <laughs> it took me just a, a little less than the time it took you to write it. But, um, <laughs> the... Well, actually... But I want this, to ask you a question. No, I, we'll come to the question in a minute. Jeremy Paxman, you know, I mean, it's incredible. The, uh, this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, what I'm calling a, a two-pan drop book. Uh, this comes from my, my grandfather. He used to judge his ministers, because uh, he was a senior, senior elder in St. Ninian's Craig Mail, and he used to judge ministers on the number of pan drops it took him to suck during their sermon. <laughs> if it was one pan drop, then they were slight and insubstantial and not really worth hearing. If it was three pan drops, they were long-winded, boring, and sending the congregation to sleep. His ideal minister was a two-pan drop minister. This, Michael, is a two pan drop book. Okay. Well, I've always, I've always felt it was best to let you have the last word. But let me, let me ask you a very straight question about the referendum, because the book is a, a very important book about the referendum. It tells the referendum story from the inside. But let me ask you the straight question. Why didn't we win the referendum? Because we lost, Michael. <laughs> I, I think I mean, there's two ways to, uh, uh, to, to look at that. I mean, either we can say, you know, we were almost there, but we lost. Uh, or alternatively, you can say, well, we started, what, two, three years ago, about 30% and got 45%. So it's the half empty or the half full interpretation of uh, political history. I tend to take the, the half full version. Uh, and everything that's happened over the last six months uh, we tend to vindicate the idea that we may have lost the referendum, but we are substantially on our way to winning Scotland. Some of the core debates in the referendum, many of the core debates were about economics, they were about the issue of currency. One of the few people you have a particularly good word to say about in this book who, who isn't part of the campaign was Mark Carney. Do you think the Bank of England was unduly influenced during the whole process by the UK government in order to try and stop 
some sensible debate about what would happen with the economy of Scotland? No, I, I think, uh, I mean, what I argue in the book, and, you know, these things are open to interpretation, is that Mark Carney and his predecessor, Mervyn King, are, are just about the only UK public officials who played things with a straight bat. I had actually no complaints uh, about the Bank of England. Uh, now, the contrast would be with Her Majesty's Treasury, uh, led by uh, Sir Nicholas McPherson, who said in January, I mean, just in case we, we thought this was just a, a rumor that he'd become politicized, he actually said to a conference in January, he said, Her Majesty's Treasury is a unionist institution, the clue is in the name, i.e. Her Majesty. But the problem with that, of course, is Her Majesty isn't a unionist institution. Uh, the monarchy in its current form, as uh, most of us know, was, uh, was founded 100 years before the Treaty of Union. Uh, so to have a, a senior civil servant with that attitude, and that obviously explains a number of the activities of the Treasury during the campaign, you know, I think is a, a serious difficulty for democracy, never mind a a serious difficulty for the, the Scottish National Party. So no complaints with the Bank of England, a substantial number of complaints about the activities of Her Majesty's Treasury. I'm going to take the first question in just a second, but you said no complaints about Her Majesty's Treasury, but many no, no, no. complaints... No complaints, complaints about, about the Bank, the Bank of, England. of England. Lots of complaints about the Treasury, but also many complaints about the UK media. Uh, the UK media come out of this book very strongly as those who were just determined not to give the yes side a fair shout and determined to be players rather than reporters. Do you think they've learned anything from that experience? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I mean, I, let, let's divide this into two parts. I fully expected uh, uh, the UK press, the Metropolitan Press, to act like the Metropolitan Press do. Uh, and frankly, if anyone in this hall doesn't think they'll act like that in this coming election, then uh, uh, that's a, a political experience we all have to learn. And incidentally, we should be delighted that the Metropolitan written press, the Mail, the Telegraph, the Express, the rest of them, act like they do. That means they're frightened. We're a danger. It means we have a chance of winning. That's what it means. So we should take it. We should take it as a, a tartan badge of courage. Uh, that's uh, a, an excellent thing. And every time we're attacked, we should say, you only get kicked if you're worth kicking. We should take that as an indication of their fear. <laughs> so nothing about that surprised me in the, in the referendum campaign, and we anticipated that. What surprised me was the degree to which the, the BBC allowed themselves to be influenced by the headlines in a biased press. And they... <laughs> and if we take the analysis by Professor John Robertson of the, the uh, West of Scotland University, he makes the point very clearly. Uh, you don't achieve balance in broadcasting by taking, you know, whatever scare story it might be, let's say Scotland is going to be consumed next week by fire and brimstone, uh, and then say we balance the broadcasting by giving somebody from the Yes campaign 20 seconds to reply and say Scotland is not going to be consumed by fire and brimstone. <laughs> uh, and John Robertson's point that he's made is a, an excellent one. That is not balance, that's allowing the agenda to be dictated uh, by a, a press corps who in the main as they are absolutely entitled to do, uh, argue or, or take a, a contrary position to us. Uh, and therefore, uh, I had no uh, surprise about the, the written press. I, I was surprised uh, and disappointed by the extent to which, particularly the network BBC, allowed themselves to be dominated by that agenda. I don't think there's many dissenters from that in this room. Uh, now, questions from the audience. Uh, has anybody got the microphone? Or who wants it? Hard to see in here. Somebody up there. First question, can we have... We'll get many questions in if they're brief. On you go. Thank you. Alec, uh, the great French chanteuse, Edith Piaf, 
wrote a song entitled, Yes, I Have No Regrets. Would that be a song for you? Too few to mention. <laughs> no, uh, I, as I remember, the, the, the last politician who quoted uh, Edith Piaf was uh, Norman Lamont, or Lamont, <laughs> or Piri Nori, as they called him in, uh, <laughs> in Shetland. The, the, uh, no, I, I've got, uh, I, I say in the book that the, you know, if you have uh, perfect hindsight, you do certain things differently. Uh, and there are certain things I would have done differently without any question. I also say, you know, any mistakes that the Yes campaign made are my responsibility. I led the campaign, so uh, they're my responsibility. Uh, but I still take the, the half full uh, version of this political story. You see, I think what's changed, uh, and some things have changed. You talked about the press, Mike. You know, we now have, at last, a daily newspaper in Scotland in the National. <laughs> arguing the, the independence case. That's a, a great move forward. Uh, I, I think we've uh, won substantial converts uh, in terms of uh, the independence argument. But the, you know, the real change basically is up here. I mean, the real change is in the, the psyche of a, a huge number of our fellow citizens. I mean, this is, in 2015, a different country from the one of 2014. The experience of the referendum has energized, activized, uh, changed the attitude, the color of the thought of many, many of our, our fellow citizens. Uh, so yeah, I've got some regrets about how we played certain issues, but I've got a lot of uh, admiration, particularly for the, the grassroots groups, the Women for Independence, the National Collective, the range of grassroots groups. that emerged in the, in the campaign, and particularly in the social media, it won us so many converts to the, to the national cause. So, uh, yeah, regrets, I have a few, but uh, I'd like to mention the things that we did well. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Somebody over here. Alec, with the, the recent Conservative posters, how does it feel to be a Tory icon? I was, just, uh, I was just checking my top pocket, uh, but it turns out to be me that's in my top pocket. <laughs> I, I, I probably, I mean, this, this might be broadcast, and I, I shouldn't be giving uh, uh, advice to the, the headquarters of the, the Labour Party or the Tory Party in London, but I'm going to do it anyway, because... Uh, some of us here, I know there's so many new activists in the party, so th this might be a, a new story to, to, to some people. Uh, I think you should never, ever put your political opponents on your posters. Never. Yeah. Not, not uh, you know, some sense of sensibility. I saw we Douglas Alexander say how dreadful it was and all the rest of it. Not because it's dreadful, but because it's stupid. Uh, and I learned this lesson back in 1992. Yep. Some of you will remember Michael Forsyth, who, who was a, an extremely, I have to introduce him to the younger members of the audience. Uh, Michael Forsyth was an extremely unpopular Tory minister. Uh, and he made a statement saying that if Scotland voted SNP in 1992, he would leave the country. Now, I thought to myself, aha! <laughs> this is something we should advertise. <laughs> So uh, we put up what I thought was an incredibly witty poster with Michael Forsyth's face under the slogan, Michael for South. <laughs> and we thought, ho, ho, ho. We printed 100,000 of these bloody leaflets. <laughs> and we couldn't hand them out because all people saw was Michael Forsyth's face and refused to take the leaflets. <laughs> and, <laughs> And after that, uh, I realized it wasn't a great idea to put your political opponents on your posters, regardless of how funny and amusing you thought it was. Now, in the case of, let's, for example, the, uh, the poster with Miliband and me uh, at the door of number 10. Now, 
under no circumstances from a Conservative perspective uh, should they place Ed Miliband outside the door of number 10. <laughs> and, you know, Miliband, if, uh, you know, a bit of wit, would realise when he gets taunted by Cameron, all he has to say is, look, the Prime Minister has just conceded the election. Mm. I mean, how I get into number 10 is neither here nor there. You've just conceded the election. Uh, but instead, you know, they, they run from, from that sort of stuff. Uh, so I, I think the, the Tory campaign is fundamentally stupid. Uh, I, I, uh, I think we should... Uh, I don't think it's doing Labour any harm, and I don't think it's doing us any harm whatsoever, because the most important thing for the Scottish National Party in every mm -hmm. Westminster election is to achieve the thing we failed to achieve since 1974, and that's to achieve relevance yeah. to a Westminster election. And listen, folks, nobody can say they were anything other than relevant to this election campaign. Okay. There is somebody at the back there. There's also somebody down here. So people are beginning to ask questions. Put your hand up and keep it up so I can see you. Is there a, somebody at the back with a microphone? That's it. Microphone just coming to you. Okay. Next time we have a Scottish referendum, would it be better to have a consultation about which currency to use, like the euro? the sterling, or a Scottish dollar? The, um, or, or, or a pound, or whatever, yeah, but the... Two things about uh, currency. Uh, firstly, the, the, in terms of scaremongering, right, it's really important, uh, in my estimation, during the campaign, and I think we got there towards the end, uh, that uh, we have the ability to laugh at scaremongering. I tell a story about... Uh, uh, about a peer of the realm, right, who uh, came into my office about a year ago. Uh, and uh, this is someone who will remain nameless, but who has done uh, this country enormous service over the last couple of years. And he's from this city uh, of Glasgow. Uh, and uh, although he's now in the House of Lords, he still speaks the, the language of the, the shipyard. And he came into my office in St. Andrew's house. Uh, and he, uh, he said to me, he said, uh, listen, Alec, I'm going to tone this down for the variety of the audience and the sensibilities of the BBC. So, he said, listen, Alec, I'm a unionist to my fingertips. But if you see that little George Osborne says one more time that we can't keep our own currency, when we invented the Bank of <laughs> England and every other thing worth inventing in the history of the modern world, then I'm going to come and join your lot. <laughs> So I think, in retrospect, bearing in mind what the gentleman said, my only regret about the, the currency is I should have done earlier what I did in the, the second television debate, uh, when I laid out uh, the four options that people in Scotland would have. Uh, and once that had been done for that audience, any time that Alistair, uh, try, Alistair Darling tried to return to the issue, I mean, they ended up hissing him, basically because he was a, a one-trick pony, and once the trick was away, there was nothing left. Of course, it was greatly helped when he, uh, he said, of course you can use sterling. <laughs> that was a <clears throat> an interesting admission. <laughs> but uh, maybe I, I regret about not taking that line earlier, but I think the ability for us to see through scare stories, the ability for us to laugh at fear-mongering, uh, and the style and confidence which in the second debate, uh, that was put forward, uh, I think is, is what I would suggest is the, the real answer to your question. Okay, thank you. There's, 
that gentleman over there is going to take it, then there's a gentleman there, and then the lady there. So on you go. Hi there. Um, I'm one of thousands of people who have cancelled my TV licence since the bias broadcast on the BBC. <laughs> I pestered them so much they actually paid me 25 quid. Um, anyway, I'm just wondering, um, I'm from Stirling and recently I believe your book signing was rescheduled. I'm just wondering what can like, normal people like us do to hold media and politicians that lie to account? For example, I'm getting Labour leaflets and junk mail claiming they in introduce free tuition fees and things like that. What can we do to you know, hold these people to account? Yes, the, uh the rocks will melt with the sun before the Labour Party introduced free tuition in Scotland. <laughs> the, uh, I think in terms of, uh, well, firstly, by the national, in terms of, you know, the, that's uh, a choice that all of us, most of us here make already, and make sure as many of your friends and neighbours uh, do the, uh, uh, the same thing. I think some of the experience of the referendum, which has actually scarred the BBC, and I think there's been some gains from it already from our perspective. I mean, this coming week, Nicola Sturgeon will take her rightful place in the national television debates uh, as far as this elections campaign. You know, it's something, if we remember, that the BBC resisted in court uh, at the last... Uh, a general uh, election, so I think that is an advance. But in reality, uh, you know, I don't think the broadcasting issue in terms of how it treats Scotland will be properly resolved till we have a broadcasting under the, the remit of our democratic parliament in Scotland. There's somebody who had their hand up here, that with the white card. That's it there. And then we're going to take that lady and that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have not yet had the chance and privilege to enjoy your book, Alec, but um, like you, I share the misgivings about um, civil service and, and, and the media. And I do believe that nowadays the one thing which is distinguishing us in huge measure from the other parties is called integrity. And. <laughs> I, I, I wonder um, what the kind of party line when you and the other 50-odd um, arrive in Westminster <laughs> soon um, will be on, on, on that, given the kind of um, opportunities for skullduggery which will be rife in the atmosphere uh, down there. Well, f firstly, I, I think we should let the people determine the numbers. Uh, the, the people of Scotland will determine the numbers that the, the SNP uh, paint the benches tartan in the House of Commons. Uh, I think it will be a substantial number, but let's let the, the people determine that. Uh, do we have a, a monopoly on integrity? No, we don't. Uh, we, we don't have a monopoly on wisdom either. Uh, nor should we just think that everyone is the same. I mean, it was quite an interesting contrast. I mean, I think that Mervyn King and Mark Carney are outstanding public servants. I know for a fact that Mervyn King in particular resisted enormous pressure in order to deal with the thing, deal with the issue as he thought uh, an independent central bank should do. And I have no complaints whatsoever. And I have particularly no complaints because I'm aware of the degree of pressure, political pressure that he was under that he resisted. So I think we should have the ability to differentiate outstanding public servants like uh, Mervyn King and Mark Carney uh, from the Sir Nicholas McPhersons of this world. We should have the ability to do that. So we shouldn't lump everyone into the, the, the same deplorable basket as uh, Her, Her Majesty's uh, Treasury. In terms of uh, skullduggery and upsetting the apple cart and, and various parliamentary techniques, uh, well, you know, I, I think there's a wee bit of experience uh, might be there in the, in the group that we have, Angus Robertson and, and the rest, and Angus Brendan McNeil, uh, uh, a man who, uh, who led the, uh, the, uh, the Cash for Honours uh, uh, inquiry. And, uh, so I, I, you know, I think uh, there's, a bit of, uh, there's a bit of background uh, which will stand us in good stead. Uh, but make no mistake, uh, you know, if the Scottish National Party, as we did uh, a generation ago, caused a, a fair amount of parliamentary interest when we were a group of four and five in a parliament of 650, uh, then the uh, very substantial group that we hope goes to 
to Westminster from Scotland, uh, I think has an unprecedented opportunity uh, to move politics uh, in a, a direction of Scotland, certainly, but also, as Nicola has rightly pointed out, in the direction of progressive politics across these islands. Ready here. Um, lately, our school has had Black Watch taken off the school curriculum, and um, I was, well, we've been campaigning to get it back, put back on the curriculum, and I know you've had some comment on this, and um, I was wondering, seeing as there's been such a demand for it to get put back on the curriculum, will there be a possibility that pupils will get the chance to be more involved in the designing of our learning? Well, I, I, I think it's a very good question. Of course, I, I know you read about my views in this in my column in the Courier in the Press and Journal. <laughs> Buy it on a Monday, okay? <laughs> uh, and obviously, I, I wrote a column about... I actually saw Black Watch, a Gregory Burke's play. For those of you who don't know, it was Play of the Year in, uh, in 2006. In 2007, it won the, the Fringe Awards at the festival. The Scottish Government... Uh, it gave the National Theatre of Scotland the finance to take Black Watch around the world where it played to the most enormous uh, audiences and had a, a rave uh, reception, for example, in Virginia, the most uh, military state in the United States uh, of America. And what the, the play is about, uh, it's about uh, uh, Scottish squaddies from the Black Watch country in, in Fife, actually, uh, in, uh, in the Iraq War. Uh, and basically, it's the most extraordinary play. It may have been in this very auditorium I saw it, actually. Uh, at one stage, the, uh, the pool table in a, a, a pub where they're playing suddenly becomes a, an armored car, and you're taken right into the heat of battle uh, in, uh, in the fray of, uh, of Iraq. And the, what the play encapsulates, and this is why it's so important, that in my estimation, every school pupil in Scotland should have the, the, the chance to study it. What it encapsulates is Scotland's attitude uh, to our military and martial story. And that attitude is we are extraordinarily proud of our men and women who fight, but we're also extraordinarily skeptical uh, about war and about the politicians who send them into illegal conflicts. <clears throat> Of course, <clears throat> I'm, slightly, I'm slightly biased. I actually make an appearance uh, in, in, the, in the play. It's uh, one of the highlights, obviously. As, uh, <laughs> but the play is about the, the men of, uh, and women of the Black Watch, uh, and it's a remarkable play. Uh, and any education authority uh, and any head teacher who thinks that it's inappropriate uh, for such a, a play about the understanding the, the psyche of this nation not to be shown, in my estimation, should hang their heads in shame. <clears throat> uh, and yes, uh, the education minister, I uh, actually saw him, uh, uh, I saw her actually a few minutes ago, Angela Constance, the education secretary, uh, will, uh, I'm sure would be interested in your, in your suggestion, and I think you should put it to uh, Angela directly. And at the gentleman there, and then we'll take the gentleman there. Gentleman there. Mr. Salmond, um, I'm David Milligan from Scott to Scott. Do you see any circumstances where we might have UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence? <coughs> uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you why. There's been two enormous gains from the referendum campaign. Uh, the first gain, and this is by far, by far the most important, is a, a change in the psyche of many of our, our fellow citizens. Uh, a change in the, the thoughts and the attitude of many people in this hall, for that matter. Uh, and that experience has changed the nation. That is the fundamental thing that's happened. But uh, as Nicola Sturgeon has rightly said, another really important thing has emerged from the, the campaign. You know, for the Scottish National Party is what, 80-plus uh, years old. Uh, and for most of that period, for the, well, for all of it, basically, the single biggest stumbling block against the achievement of Scottish independence 
has not been to convince people that Scotland should be independent, but to convince people there was actually a process by which we could become independent. And the biggest gain in that sense from the referendum campaign is we have now what Nicola has identified as the gold standard of how Scotland goes from where we are now to become an independent country. And that's quite simple. That is, at any Scottish election, a political party or parties put in their manifesto a commitment to hold a referendum on independence and then win a majority in that parliament. And if that is done, then that referendum will be held. And if the people of Scotland so judge, Scotland will become an independent country. That is the gold standard. <clears throat> now, I'm asked many times, just about every interview I, I conduct, when is that referendum going to be? And I'm in the most wonderful position that I haven't been in for the greater part of the last 25 years. I can look that interviewer straight in the eye and say, that is a matter for Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> we have, we're rapidly running out of time. I'm probably going to be able to take about three more questions. The gentleman over there who was standing for some time, there is a gentleman, I'm sorry, the back there, and there's a lady on the end here, and we'll take those three. We'll take all three together. Alec wants to take them together just to keep time going. So first question there. Uh, Mr. Salmond, um, see, um, we've got um, huge challenges ahead in terms of uh, infrastructure building in our country, investment required. See the new bank, uh, the BRICS Bank, the International Bank for Development. Should Scotland be applying for membership of that? Thank you. Gentleman in the middle up here. Hand up, please. Okay. Sorry, there's so many gentlemen who want to ask questions. It's at the back there and he's standing up. Sorry about that. And then we'll get a microphone down here. Lady on the end here. Yep. Okay, please. No, there's a gentleman who's standing up there with a the microphone. Yep. Hello, Alec. Hi. Hello. Hi. Can I start by thanking, on behalf of my wife and my five children, uh, for your, your service and being the catalyst for change and a fairer future for them? <laughs> my, my question is I haven't read your book yet, but what would be the most controversial thing that you've put in your book that you weren't able to say in your position as a First Minister. <laughs> I'm not sure you should have tempted him with that, but never mind. Thank you. Lady at the bottom end here. Hello, Mr. Salmond. I can't see you, but I'm just going to say hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that um, you influenced my nephew, who was 14 during the referendum, and um, he worked really hard to get a, a yes, but as we know, it was a no, and he was crushed. But he picked himself up because he said, this is what Alex Salmon would do. He picked himself up, and he's now on the Scottish Youth Parliament. And he actually... <laughs> and he actually asked me if I got a chance to speak to you. Would you actually think about talking at the Scottish Parliament. Right. Yeah. I'll do the three questions very quickly, and then I'm going to go back to the, uh, the rostrum to do a, just a, a, final, uh, a final reading, if uh, I may, just so that the guys doing the sound have it, uh, have it set up. Uh, firstly, uh, I think we should consider any ideas in terms of infrastructure development. In fact, one of the big successes of our, our term in office has been the development through John Swinney's work of the uh, of NPD, the non-profit distribution program, uh, non-profit distribution has allowed us, in the circumstances of enormous capital cutbacks from Westminster, uh, to pursue a schools and hospital program. Uh, we've actually built or refurbished, uh, uh, I think, about 50% oh, more schools uh, than was done in the previous eight years, despite the capital cutbacks as a result of the NPD approach in the schools for the future. So, any other uh, initiatives? 
in terms of capital infrastructure development of the nation, we should certainly consider and consider favorably. In terms of uh, revelations, then, I think the uh, passage which actually reveals in details the extent of the uh, perfidy of the United Kingdom Treasury with regard to the leaks about the Royal Bank of Scotland uh, and the arrangement with the, uh, the BBC in terms of who it was leaked to and when, uh, basically 25 minutes before the board meeting taking the decision had even come to a conclusion. Uh, I think that is, uh, should be studied very carefully because it's a, a textbook example of what happens when a, a civil service department effectively uh, goes, uh, uh, goes out of control in terms of what would normally be judged as correct behavior for civil servants. Uh, and uh, the answer to the third question I'm delighted to say is yes, I'll be delighted to accept an invitation from your nephew. Thank you. And if the uh, guys turn the uh, microphones on, then uh, we'll have a quick look. This is a, a wee section from the, the epilogue uh, of the book. I, I was tempted to call it Last Call and to do it as Reverend I Am Jolly, but... <laughs> For all of uh, my political life, I believed in Scottish independence. Since 1997 and the vote to establish a Scottish Parliament, I've believed it to be likely. Since the referendum campaign of this year, I believed it to be a matter of when, not if. There are a number of situations which could provide the circumstances. There are a number of events which could precipitate the next opportunity. There are a number of variables which dictate the timing, a timing which ultimately lies in the hands of the people. And that is the point. The yes side lost the vote, but the referendum changed the nation. The people who emerged from the 100 Days campaign are different from those who embarked on that journey. That changed nation will both create and secure the future opportunities for progress. The means and procedure are now set. The Scottish people can, if they so wish, at any Scottish election, vote for a party or parties who wish to put the matter to the touch once again. After all, everyone deserves a second chance, every person and every nation. Thank you. And can I just remind people that Alec will be signing copies of the book at four o'clock at the conclusion of conference. So if you form an orderly queue now, you should get to it. Thank you very much. Thank you.